Hey guys and welcome back to my channel for another mystery. Today's one is one that you may have heard of. It's one that always pops up on those UK strangest disappearances, the strangest mystery lists that you find all over the internet. But it's not one that I've really particularly seen covered on YouTube so I figured I might as well do it. This is the case of Treveline Evans. It probably hasn't been covered that much because there just isn't much to it. Treveline just disappeared and that's it. There were no clues, no leads to anything and we're nearly 30 years on and police are no closer now than they were in 1990. Treveline was 53 years old when she disappeared on Saturday June 16th 1990 from a town called Langolan in Wales. Now I am very aware that I'm probably saying Langolan <laughs> wrong. I'm going to put it on the screen. Apologies to any Welsh viewers. I did try and like google it to find out if there was any like Thing that told me how to pronounce it. There wasn't. Um, I'm no closer now than I was before. So I'm going to say Langolan, but probably wrong. Um, so Langolan's a small town in North East Wales. It's set on the River Dee, it's surrounded by countryside and mountains, and it's got quite a small population. Um, as of 2011, the population was about 3,800. It's probably even a little bit less than this in 1990 when Treveline disappeared. But although it has a small population, it's really, really popular with tourists because of all the mountains, the countryside, people, hikers love to go and visit there. So it's got sort of like a transient population of tourists constantly in and out. But in terms of the actual population, the people who live there, everyone knew everyone. At least if you didn't know somebody, you'd know somebody who did know that person. So it was quite a small place. In the week leading up to her disappearance, Trevelyan had actually been away with her husband, Richard. The two were renovating their holiday cottage that they had near the coast of Rudland. Again, probably pronouncing that wrong. Um, but Trevelyan returned early, returning on Wednesday the 13th of June whilst Richard stayed out there. They were renovating the place and they had workmen coming in. So Richard said he'd stay out there whilst Trevelyan went back and ran the business. The two of them owned a shop called Attic Antiques in the main high street of Langolan. Travelling and Richard were happily married. It's not thought that they had any big problems. Of course, they'd bicker like couples did, but overall, they were very, very happy. They had a son and they had two grandsons, so they absolutely doted on. They were really happy in their everyday life. So, like I said, the couple owned a shop called Attic Antiques, which was on Church Street. And that morning that Trevelyne disappeared, so Saturday the 16th of June, Trevelyne goes and opens up the shop like normal at 9.30am. Usually the opening hours would be from about 9.30 to about 4pm. She parks her blue Ford Escort about 30 yards away in her usual spot and opens up the shop, as always. That morning about 25 people popped into the shop to either say hi to Trevelyne as one of her friends or just to browse as a customer. Um, according to friends, Trevelyne seemed perfectly happy that morning. She had no problem, she didn't say anything. She even told them that she had plans to go out that evening. But then Trevelyne leaves the shop at about 12.40pm and she leaves a note on the door which would become synonymous with this case. It was a note in Trevelyne's handwriting that said, back in two minutes. Just before she leaves the sign, she's seen in her shop talking to a well-dressed man in a suit, but this man has never been identified. And about 1pm, Trevelyne buys an apple and a banana and is seen crossing Castle Street, which I put a map up on the screen now so you can sort of see where places are. Um, and it seems like she's on her way back to the shop. Where she was seen on Castle Street was about a quarter of a mile from her shop. So the timing here, about 20 minutes, is probably about right for her to walk there, buy her lunch, and then start to walk back. Another confirmed sighting of Trevelyne comes at about 2.30, and this one's a little bit stranger. She's seen at 2.30 near her home on Market Street. And she's seen by somebody who knew her pretty well, so could like definitely say that it was 100% Treveline. But it's strange that this is now an hour and a half later and she's still just wandering around. Following this, there were two other potential sightings, but these ones aren't exactly confirmed. They weren't by people who knew her that well. There was one sighting at 2.35 p.m. Um, she was seen walking down the A5, sort of like out of town. And another sighting at 3.45pm, which is a woman matching her description walking on Park Avenue, sort of like towards the river. But both of these sightings have been disputed, so we can't hold much weight in these. When Richard phones home that night, there's no answer. He tries to call several times and she just isn't picking up. And he finds this a bit strange because she hadn't told him that she had any plans to go out that night. And it was very unlike his wife. 
And so he decides to contact some friends to see if they've heard from her as well. Bear in mind this is 1990 and mobile phones didn't really exist. He learns from her friends that nobody had seen her since around midday. Concerned, he asks one of these friends to go to the shop to see if Trevelyne's there. He's worried that she's had a fall or something. But they get to the shop and all they see is the sign on the door saying back in two minutes. The friend also tells Richard that Trevelyne's car is still parked in its usual spot outside the shop and Richard really begins to worry. Police attend the scene and they find that Trevelyne's coat, bag and car keys are still in the shop. A banana skin is found in the bin, suggesting that Trevelyne may have returned to the shop after buying her lunch. She bought a banana and an apple. So a lot of people think that it's highly likely that Trevelyne did return to the shop, ate her banana and then left again. But of course this banana skin could have been from that morning or even the day before. There's no way of knowing. I think it's clear that Trevelyne didn't intend on being away from the shop for long. She left all of her belongings in there and left the sign on the door saying she'd be back in two minutes. If she intended to leave for the day, she would have just closed up. This became a huge investigation, like I said, the biggest in North Wales history. Police knocked door to door trying to look for anybody who had seen any sign of Trevelyne. They searched the countryside, they searched the water, they brought in dogs. Richard personally offered a £5,000 reward to anybody who had any information but there was nothing. There was no sign of Trevelyne. It seemed like she just disappeared from the earth. The detective chief inspector, Colin Edward, said a couple of years later in 1992, that it is without a doubt the strangest inquiry I have ever been involved with. How a happily married woman could vanish without a trace on a sunny Saturday morning in a busy town centre is totally baffling. They eventually managed to piece together Trevelyne's movements from witnesses who had seen her throughout the day and I've already kind of said some of these witness sightings. We know that she was definitely near her home at around 2.30pm but the two sightings following this are deemed pretty unreliable. So 2.30pm is the last time that we can fully place her. But why would Trevely be walking near her home at 2.30pm when she had a shop to be running? It seems like she went for lunch leaving the back in two minutes sign and then just decided not to return, going for a long walk instead, which is unlike her. The strangest thing to come out of the investigation was that in the days before her disappearance, Trevelyne was spotted several times around town in the company of a man who nobody recognised, which is really strange because like I said, this is the kind of place where everyone knows everyone. They said this man was always well dressed in a suit, potentially the same man who was seen in Trevelyne's shop that morning. Um, and they always appear to be having very intense conversations, maybe bickering about something, maybe just having a very deep conversation. And this man has never been identified. And although there was a sketch of him circulated, years later in 2001, police said this sketch was actually not accurate at all. Over the years, there have been potential sightings of Trevelyne all around the world, in remote towns in Australia, in France, in London. In 1993, police said they actually got a call from a woman who was walking along the riverbank of the River Dee, who said that she just had an overwhelming feeling that Trevelyne was buried nearby. And so please take this seriously. They go out with dogs and they search the area and of course they find nothing. The case is eventually closed as a cold case and Trevelyne is declared legally dead in 1997. However, in 2001, they reopened the case hoping that new technology will lead them to a clue. But it remained as it always had, there's still no clues. At one point Richard is actually arrested and brought in for questioning, but there was a lack of evidence, nothing suggested that he'd done anything wrong. Um, he was released without charge. Where he claimed to be that week in Rudlin was over an hour's drive from Langolan, and he was seen by about half a dozen witnesses throughout the day that Trevelyne disappeared, and there's just no way that he could have driven back to Langolan, hurt his wife, disposed of her body, and then got back. With all the witness sightings of him that day, there was even one workman who said that he was literally in the cottage with Richard pretty much all day, so it couldn't have been him. Although it's widely thought in Langland today still that Richard is the one who did it. The main focus of this new 2001 investigation once opened was to track all of Trevelyne's movements in the week leading up to her disappearance. They believed that the clue was in the week before. And of course, the main thing they wanted to do was to be able to identify this well-dressed man, but they've never been able to do it. Police have said since very early on in the investigation that they believe that foul play is involved and that Trevelyne did not leave voluntarily. But that's pretty much all they have to offer us. Um, as of 2015, it seems like the case is still open, but the investigation is not currently active. So they'll take in any new leads, but there's not people like investigating it every single day. 
So what are the possibilities here? Honestly, I can't offer you much apart from pure speculation due to the complete lack of clues in this case. But we're basically looking at her either being abducted and likely murdered, leaving voluntarily, or she had some kind of mental episode or even just physical health episode and ends up wandering off. So we'll address her voluntarily leaving first. And honestly, I don't think this is too possible. Um, Treveline had no problems. Her and her husband had a pretty happy marriage according to everyone who knew them. They had their son, they had their grandson, so they absolutely adored. They were pretty well off. They had a very nice home. They had their business, which was going well. They even had like enough leftover money to have a holiday cottage on the coast. Like they were doing very, very well for themselves. And I know you don't necessarily need a reason to disappear. Anybody can decide to disappear anytime, no matter what's going on in their life. But it does seem unlikely. And I think the potential that she committed suicide falls under this same umbrella as well. It's possible, but again, she showed no signs of having any sort of mental health problems or that she was having any problems whatsoever. And also the fact that a body was never found suggests that suicide was probably unlikely because in most suicide cases, the bodies are eventually found. If you're gonna commit suicide, you don't go to a huge length to make sure that your body is never found. I'm sure some people do, but most don't. The only reason I can think that she would have left voluntarily is if she had some sort of connection to this man in the suit that she was seen with in the days before. Honestly, very little information online about this man in the suit. I don't know what age he was. I know that he was fairly tall and had dark hair, but that was all I could really figure out. I don't know if the man was Trevelyne's age, younger, older, I don't know. But was he potentially a lover who she ran away with to start a new life? Possible, but again, it's just speculation. I mean, this doesn't seem like her. She had a very good relationship. Like I said, she had a grandson who, a lot of people say that she would never have left her grandsons. But as well, the people who saw Trevelyne with this man in the days leading up to her disappearance said that it didn't seem romantic. It seemed like they were arguing. Also her having some kind of mental break and wandering away from the town could be argued against for many of the same reasons. She likely would have been found eventually. Also you'd think anyway, of course this is a countryside and there are many places that a body could be hidden, but they had dog, they had people searching and somebody probably would have found her. Um, it was also likely as well that she had a physical illness, a stroke or something that made her sort of like just get disorientated and wander away as well. The prevailing theory, which is one the police stand by, is that she was abducted and murdered, that there was definitely foul play involved, most likely involving the man in the suit. Maybe she was walking back to the shop with her lunch when this man pulls up next to her in a car. She knows him and the man offers her a lift back and she says, sure, why not? Only this man had more sinister intentions. The reason they think she got into someone's car voluntarily is because nobody saw a struggle. You're talking about a busy high street on a Saturday morning. There were a lot of people around and the people would have noticed somebody being forcefully put into a car. They wouldn't, however, notice somebody just getting into a car. Which is why police believe that Trevelyne knew whoever abducted her. The main question that I struggle with is why Treveline? She was a middle-aged antique shop owner who lived in this small town in the middle of Wales. She lived a very, very quiet life. So why would somebody want to take her? She had no known enemies. Nothing was stolen from her shop, so it wasn't a robbery. There was never any money taken from any of her bank accounts. I mean, if you're going to this area to abduct somebody, then an easier victim would be a hiker or a tourist, somebody who people wouldn't immediately notice was missing. So why would they go for Treveline? I would feel very, very confident in saying that whoever did this knew Treveline and she knew them. Perhaps not well enough to be known by her family as well, maybe just a casual acquaintance, but somebody that she'd feel comfortable talking to. Her body would likely be buried somewhere close, but not too close. I mean, we're talking about rural Wales here. There is just countryside as far as the eyes can see. So many options for burying a body. It would be near impossible to pin down an exact location in this area. A lot of people speculate that she could be in the River Dee, her body weighed down somehow, or maybe stuck in some kind of cavern in the river walls. Um, again, it is likely, but they did send people into the river to look, and I'm sure, I mean, in nearly 30 years, parts of her may have surfaced. I think it does seem like Treveline intended to return back to her shop that day. If she didn't, she would have just closed up early. Putting a sign up saying back in two minutes shows that she didn't intend to come back. Maybe she knew it would be longer than two minutes. She needed to walk into town to get her lunch, but she intended to come back. 
back. The banana skin in the bin in the shop is spoken about a lot in this case, but I can't help but feel that it's some kind of red herring. A lot of people say that, that surely means that she returned back to the shop with her banana that she ate for lunch but I think it was probably more likely from that morning. I don't think Trevelyne ever returned because if she did, she would have taken down the sign. But that's all I can really offer you for this case. There's so little to go on here, but I still think it's important to talk about it because maybe someone out there knows something. Cases like this are so infuriating, I know, but they're really important to get out there. If you like what I'm doing here on my channel, then make sure you click the subscribe button down below. There's a new midweek mystery video every single Wednesday. I do a serial killer spotlight on the last Saturday of every month. And as of Friday, I'll be doing history videos as well. My first ever history video will be up on Friday. I'm gonna have no set schedule for it, I don't think at this point, but make sure you stay tuned for that. I'm really excited to share it with you. I'm a bit of a history nerd, so I think it's really interesting. And I'm really excited to get some of your feedback. And I've just realized that my necklace has been upside down for probably this whole video, which is wonderful, but I'm sure there's more important things to focus on in this video. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye guys.